Well, good evening. evening. Are you a believer tonight? A believer in our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? You're a part of something. Do you know when you were born again, you were born into something? You were born into something that's bigger than yourself. You were born into a family. You were born into the church. It was a group that God ordained that we be a part of. And we are part of that as the church. Uh, when uh, Sister Kathy uh, texted me uh, earlier in the week and asked if I had a topic or a title um, for the sermon tonight, at that moment I really didn't, but it seemed like God just gave it to me right away based on some things that I had been, he had been helping me think about over the last few weeks and how I'd been putting some things together. I didn't really have a title, but immediately it came to me, Better Together. We're better together. Do you believe that? I believe Jesus believed that. And it's very important to him, and we'll see in Scripture in just a minute, of how he stressed the importance of us being together, of our unity. Now, unity is something that has been, uh, I guess you could say, kind of a a calling card of the Church of God movement ever since its beginnings, of how... Uh, one of the slogans is, I guess you could say, we reach our hand in fellowship to every blood-washed one. And that means that everyone who has been uh, accepted Jesus as their Savior, who's been redeemed, who's had their sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, is a part of God's church, is a part of the church of God. He's been born into it. And you might ask, well, how can I join the church? You can't join the church like you can join a country club or join the the uh, the 24-hour fitness club or whatever it is, but you're born into the church. It's something that God issues us into. As part of that, we have responsibilities, we have great privileges, but it's awesome to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Paul emphasized it when he talked about it, uh, describing it as, use a metaphor of, of, of a body. How the church is the body of Christ. You know how our, our bodies, our physical bodies, have different parts. We have eyes and we have feet and we have toes and fingers. And all those parts, not one of those parts is the body, but all the parts together make up the body. And Paul used that metaphor of the body talking about the church. All the parts are important. In uh, March of 1981, anybody remember 1981? It was kind of a fog. (laughs) President Reagan was shot by John Hinckley Jr. and was hospitalized for several weeks. Now, although President Reagan was, of course, the nation's chief executive and he was a great president, his hospitalization had little impact on the nation's activity. Government continued on. On the other hand, suppose the garbage collectors in this country went on strike, as they did a few years ago in Philadelphia. You may have heard about that. That city was not only in a literal mess, the pile of decaying trash quickly just accumulating, becoming a health hazard. A three-week nationwide strike would paralyze the country. So who is more important, the president or a garbage collector? In the body of Christ, seemingly insignificant ones are urgently needed. I don't want us to lose this, and Paul emphasized this too. Even like what Pastor Doyce was just saying, the lights going up on the thing, things that we don't uh, notice sometimes of people working and contributing to the life and to the movement of the church are important for us to be able to function as the body that God wants us to. And we each have our part. The head cannot say, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are indispensable. Let's not lose the importance. And I'm not just talking, uh, I'm talking to even the ones who think your function is not all that important. Know that it is important. Know that it is important. Let's not um, 
demean or look down or think that other some functions are not important and then or maybe look at other things and be jealous of certain things. God gave as he saw fit to each one. And each one is responsible to live out and flesh out and um, be responsible to uh, do what Pastor Doy said this morning, find your purpose of what God has gifted you and called you to do and be a part of the body of the church so that it will function as it should. Using the analogy of the body, Paul emphasizes the importance of each church member. If a seemingly insignificant part is taken away, the whole body becomes less effective. So we should not look down on those who seem unimportant. And we should not be jealous of others who have what we might call impressive gifts. Instead, we should use the gifts we have been given and encourage others to use theirs. Let's not lose that. Let's encourage others to use theirs. We're better together. Better together. Let's not just focus on what ours is, but how can I encourage Leslie to use hers? How can I encourage Bob to use his gift? Edward Everett Hale, the distinguished poet and former chaplain of the U.S. Senate, eloquently captured the essence of every American's duty. Now, this is getting away from the church, speaking of us as Americans. He said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, that I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I shall do. Can you say that you shall do what it is that God has put on you to do? It's not only our American duty, but our duty as part of God's church. Do your part. Do your part. I have a picture. I wish I could have found it from when I was probably about seven or eight years old, and we went to uh, some amusement park, maybe like a Six Flags or something like that. And they had a, um, you've seen these probably before, a board is a painting on this board, and you can walk behind it, and there's a cutout on the head. And you step up, the little kid steps up on the stool and sticks their head through the hole, in the wall, and there's Superman there, you know, Superman on the outside of the wall, and this little kid's head sticking out of the thing, and I have one that's kind of like that, I think it was Superman, and it's funny, and it, you know, we we get a, a laugh out of it, and you may have had pictures taken that way before, but it's humorous because the head doesn't fit the body, right? If we could picture Christ as the head of our local church body, our local body of believers, would the world laugh at the misfit? Or would they stand in awe of a human body so closely related to a divine head? Christ is the head of the body. The body is the church. I was, uh, it was mentioned already about uh, the wedding yesterday, and it was a, a great service. And he talked about uh, the, the unity of that, of the... Um, the body and the head. And as the body, that's us, the members of the church, we come together with our different um, giftedness, uh, whatever it is that God has put on us, our talents, our gifts, our abilities, and he puts us together as diverse as we are and as weird as we might think it is, he puts us together to be a functioning body. And that body is supposed to represent to the world who Christ is. When the, when the world looks at the body of Christ, they should see that, Christ. They should see Christ, and if they don't, something has gone amiss. And I think you might agree with me that the something that's gone amiss is our togetherness, our unity, our unity. How important is unity? Um, if you read in John, there's a lot of red letters. Anybody got a red letter Bible? Don't you like the red letter Bibles? If you go to John and you start around chapter 12, there's going to be a whole bunch of red letters and very little black ones. And Jesus is really laying it out there for his disciples. Um, We talked this morning about uh, the triumphal entry, and this is Palm Sunday, and how um, this was the beginning of the end, so to speak, which we know it really wasn't the end. It was the beginning for all of us, really. But the beginning of the end of 
Christ's mission as a human being, God in the flesh on earth, his mission as a redeemer for us, his mission as a savior for us, as a substitute, as a lamb that would be slain for us. And the beginning of that week was when he came in to Jerusalem on that colt. And then the other things started along the way. And we'll be observing some of those things in this, what we might call the Passion Week or the Holy Week. But when you look in John, and it's in the other Gospels too, when it's going through this Holy Week, and he gets to the part and he's explaining to his disciples, you know, this is it. We're getting down to it. I'm going to not be with you much longer. And they're like, what are you talking about? Where are you going? And they're, they're not getting it. And they finally get it. And he says, I'm going to be with my Father. And Jesus was all about the work of the Father. He was all about being, doing the work of the Father. And he said, I'm going to the Father. And if I don't, I can't do this rest of it. And there's something else that has to happen. And you can, you can read. But I want, to, I want us to read uh, in John... I must confess to you, I told Rebecca even just a couple minutes before I came up here, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> God has put a lot of things on me, and I've got pages worth of things that I've written down and thoughts that God has given me. And um, But it seemed like uh, he said, just, just go to this. Go to this in John. So we're going to read in, in John and see Jesus' words. And see how important this unity is for us, the church. It seems like I would have marked it, huh? Yeah, okay, there it is. All right, we're going to be in John chapter 17. Now, uh, leading up to this... Um, they had been in the upper room. They had had communion. Uh, they had um, had the Passover feast together. They had, um, Jesus had washed their feet. He had said, there's going to be one among you that's going to deny, that's going to uh, betray me. There's going to be one that's even going to deny me. He's talking to Peter. And, uh, Peter said, I'll never. And he said, you know, how the story goes with that. So all this has gone on. And then he goes in. Uh, he goes in to pray for himself. You remember how he prays that if the cup could be passed from him, let it, uh, if that could be God's will, let it, let it uh, be. But if, if it has to be God's will that this happen, I'll do it. And uh, he surrendered to that. And then in John 17, um, starting with verse 1, it says Jesus prays for himself. And then he talks about... Um, Father, the time has come. Glorify yourself. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And he goes on uh, praying for himself. And then in verse 6, he goes on to pray for his disciples. He prays for his disciples there. And then in verse 20 is where I want us to get to now. Jesus prays for all believers. I asked you when I first got up, are you a believer? Are you a believer? This prayer was for you. Jesus prayed this for me. He prayed this for you. John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, speaking of the disciples who he just prayed for. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed for me. Verse 21. That all of them may be what? May be one. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Was it important for there to be unity? 
for there to be oneness among the believers. Jesus prayed for it to be so. Jesus knew of the importance of us being together. Now, we've said it before. There doesn't have to be uniformity where everybody's exactly alike. And there doesn't have to be unanimity, I think is how you say it, where, everybody, where everything is unanimous for there to be unity. We can work together and be good together in unity without being clones of each other. Thank goodness. God didn't make us that way. He made us all different, right? So how can we work on this unity? We've established that it's important. Jesus prayed for it. How can we work on this unity? Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, starting in uh, verse 1. Paul speaks about the unity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then it goes on. I won't read the rest of it right now. But we have to determine how much we're going to we're going to live with each other in unity. Part, how are we going to do that? I think part of it is we're going to have to learn to die a little. We're going to have to die a little. Pastor Joyce preaches about this a lot. But we have to die a little to be able to live with each other. Romans 12, 4 and 5, we're reminded of the power of being connected together. Or Paul again says, just as he's speaking of the body again, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We spoke in Sunday school a few weeks ago about how people are looking for, well, Pastor Deutsch talked about this morning, their place in this world. They're wondering, where do I fit in? How do I, um, where do I belong? This verse right here in Romans gives us a clue of where we belong. It says, we all belong to each other. We belong to each other. Uh, verse 5 says, so in Christ, you said earlier, I asked you, who's asked Christ as their Savior? Who's been saved? Who's been born again? In Christ, we who are many form one body and each member of that body belongs to all the others. We belong to each other. That's where we belong. How are we going to make that work out? How do we work that out? Just like a body has different parts, the body of Christ has different parts. And each of these parts are part of the same body, but have a different function. We're members of one another individually. Now, those of you tonight who raised your hand earlier or who said amen or said yes or whatever, those of you who are believers are connected to every other believer in this room. And not only to every other believer in this room, every other believer, period. Every other believer in all the world. When we go to Dominican Republic, Angela, next week, we are connected to those believers down there. And we're connected already without even knowing them. But once we go and we'll get to know them and we'll build some relationship with them, we'll even have a closer connectedness with them. And we'll maybe have that uh, a, a spirit of unity with them that we haven't been able to experience until then. You're still an individual. But you're woven together, connected together, part of the same body. That's amazing to me. That means that this body is big. It's huge. This body is used by God. Do you know what the huge, the largest living organism is? Anybody got to guess the largest living organism? You might be thinking of an animal, maybe like one of the big whales. It's not an animal. You might think of a tree like the big sequoias. It's a huge living organism. That's big, but that's not it. Anybody know or read about this before? I didn't print it out, so I got it on my handy-dandy little doodad here. <laughs> it's, 
What is the largest living thing? Not animal, but living organism. The biggest living thing is not, in fact, an animal at all, but a plant. The quaking aspen forest holds the record. The quaking aspen, anybody ever been out west, like to um, Colorado, Utah, and seen the aspen trees? The quaking aspen sends out underground shoots that reemerge elsewhere as new trunks. Picture that. Quaking aspen groves have been measured at 200 acres wide, almost 7,000 tons worth of aspen, all from the same plant. That makes the quaking aspen grove the largest living organism on earth. I'm not going to go on and read the rest of it, more scientific stuff. But what I want to get to, they're all connected, right? They're all individuals. You see, the, if you're just walking across the mountainside there, you see the individual trees. But if you were able to go under and look, and they explained in that, you can go Google it or whatever, how they were able to tell how they're all connected. But they're all connected together underneath. Their root system connects them together. In Christ, we're all connected together. We're all one body. And I would say that we are the largest living organism on earth, not the aspen grove in Utah or wherever that was, but as the body of Christ, the church of the living God, we are a huge living organism. Now my question is, are we living? Are we living? I hope that we can say that we are. We serve a living God. His church, the body, should be living too. And that means that uh, we need to maybe exhibit some characteristics of something that looks like it's living and really be moving and not just sitting. Maybe not just um, coming and per, um, taking in and not participating in the movement of it. Were y'all at, uh, who all was at Family Day we had at the park uh, a couple weeks ago? That last event, I appreciate Becca putting all that together. I don't know if she's in here or not. But she put the games together in that relay. And that last one was a doozy, wasn't it? Remember the two-by-sixes they had with the, uh, she remembers it. Jennifer, Jennifer remembers it. Uh, yeah, and uh, it had the, the ropes uh, uh, connected to it. There was these, if you weren't, weren't there, I'll try to describe it. It was two by six boards, and they had three or four sections of ropes attached to each board. And four people were supposed to put their right foot on one plank, their left foot on the other plank, and then they would have a row of four people doing the same thing. And they would each grab a rope that was connected to the board, and they would walk like this. With that, you can imagine it's like a huge ski that you're on, but it was four people on it. And they were having to move the, those planks along from the starting point to the ending point. And Jennifer, she was a master at this. She got it going because she was saying, left, right, left, right. And she was, uh, march, she was giving them marching orders. And they were able to move those planks from that. It was up a hill and around a curve. Uh, Becca, that was pretty tough. But it was good, and it was good to be able to watch them working together, and they were moving along. Now, if one of them had just stood there, it would have made it a lot harder, huh, Jennifer? It would have made it a lot harder to move that along. We've got to participate in, get involved in the movement of the church. Um, I think a lot of times we, we get confused with church, and maybe just in our vocabulary, we say, um, well, I, we get it the, how can I say this? I want us to think of the church as something bigger than just a church service. It's not just something we come to at 1030 on Sunday morning and we sit here and we sing a few songs and that's great and we pray with each other and we get help from that. We hear the word, but um, we say we've, we've been to church or we've been in church or I've been to church. The church is bigger than that. Church is more than just an event that happens at a certain time at a building, at an address. The church is a living organism, and it should be a living, moving organism. The church is a movement. That's another thing the Church of God has been saying for a long time. Where we tried to get away from the denominationalism part of it because those things divide, seemingly, instead of uniting. And we say we're, we're a movement a Church of God movement that's a Reformation movement that's moving to try to remove things that divide us 
as the body of Christ. Now, I'm not against denominations as long as they're not dividing God's church. God's church needs to be united and moving together to be able to accomplish the purposes, like Pastor Doyce was talking about this morning, the purposes that God has for us as his body. I got way off my notes. All right. So be a contributor, contributor to the movement of the church, not just a taker, not just a taker in it, not just a sitter, not just or a, in that case, a stander on the planks, but be a contributor to the movement of the church. It's easy to just be a spectator, but I want to encourage you to get moving with the church. How can we work together? We're better together. How can we work together? We can see ourselves as part of a larger movement. We talked about that. We can contribute to that movement and not just be a taker in it. Um, how about this? When it comes to working better together, believe the best about people. Can we believe the best about people? Now, this could be tough because there's a lot of bad people. It's just a lot of bad people in this world. But when it comes to doing something together, how about we choose to believe the best about people? It goes kind of like this. Can you believe she said that? Can you believe she's doing that, blah, 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 whatever, and you come up, no, I can't. What, what'd she do? And, um, and we get in and we're talking and we, we build this thing up. And maybe we could be the person that comes in and say, well, no, I can't really believe that. Are you sure you were talking about the same person? Because I know them to be uh, whatever and, and say something good about them. Uh, uh, be- believe something good about that person. Let's start off the conversation believing the best about them. Now, it might shoot you in the foot later. A lot of times it will. Uh, the bad will happen. But let's start off by believing the, be- the best about people. I think that will help us to work together in unity and move on together better. Um, so what if you get shot in the foot? Maybe that's somebody else's gift that they can bandage that up and they can get you moving on. All right, <laughs> that's somebody else's the part in the body of the Christ is to keep us moving when we get shot in the foot. Let's at least begin with the best as a starting point with people. The issue of unity is so important. We're all different, aren't we? Can we celebrate differences while protecting unity? I think we can. We're all different. God has made us this way. It's okay. It's okay. You know who Dolly is? Dolly the sheep? (laughs) I remember that from several years ago. Scientists were working on cloning And uh, they were able to clone this. We're not clones, are we? God forbid that we ever end up that way. But God made us different. He made us that way. He made us not to be clones. And that diversity can be celebrated among us. And God can work in that diversity to make us all better together, even as different as we are. It's wonderful. And we can celebrate the differences And would it surprise us that God would use lots of different kinds of people in lots of different kinds of ways to get His glory in lots of different places by lots of different means? God is a diverse God. You don't have to look very far to believe that if you believe that He's the creator of everything. That's the kind of God we have. We can celebrate our differences while protecting unity. While developing a nose that sniffs out things that are trying to cause a schism or a fracture. By um, noticing things and being keen to, to pick up on things that might be divisive. The divisiveness that kills us as a body. 
We've probably seen it happen. How it doesn't take very much, really, to divide and to destroy what God wants. But you know what? It also wouldn't take very much to really just explode this place for the good, in a good way. The issue of unity. If we keep marching into the future together, and we do great things, we reach people in the city, we reach pre- people across the ocean, we build buildings, we raise money, we see people being helped, we do all these things, but we're all busted apart, we're not unified together, and we don't value unity. What good is it really? Do we really want to be a part of that, of something like that? We're better together. We're better together. So we remain vigilant to protect unity. Not only because in not doing so could be the downfall of us, but we live in unity because that's something that's close to the heart of God. God is a God of community. He's a God of unity. God, the Trinity, think of that. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all three together, individuals, but all one God. That's unity. That's community. That's togetherness. The wedding we mentioned earlier, a marriage between a husband and a wife. Two things coming together, making a bond with the Holy Spirit in their life too. Three cords are not easily broken. Things are, God is a God of coming together. God is a God of unity. The devil is all about breaking up. He's all about dividing and splitting and divisiveness. But God is a God of coming together in relationship, in unity. We're better together. Now, not only... Let me read Ephesians um, 4, 1 through 3 again. Let's uh, pick up on some of these things that helps us to know how to live together. One of them, he says, uh, be humble. Now, I'm not going to preach a sermon on each one, although it could happen. Uh, Somebody could. But I want you to just chew on them a minute as I read them. Be humble. Be gentle. Be patient. These are all things that we can do to be able to live together with each other better. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That tells me it's not just something that happens. We have to make an effort. Make an effort at it. I like, um, I can't remember which uh, translation it was, but in this uh, verse it said, making allowances for each other's faults. Does anybody have faults? Oh, okay. Well, not everybody's hands went up. Okay, we'll let y'all deal with that later. All altars will be open. You can come repent for your lying. <laughs> we all have faults, don't we? We have to work together with them. It says make allowances for each other's faults. What's that mean? Create a little slack in the line. Give a little grace. You're going to need it because we're going to be bumping up against each other a lot. Might even offend each other. We need to make allowances for that. And why would we make allowances for that? The next thing says... Because of our love. Our love. We sang, I think the first song we sang tonight, they will know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Bearing with one another in love. Unity. There's no substitute for it. We're better together. Now, not only do we need to learn to make allowances and live with each other in peace, we just plain need each other. 
We need each other. We need to learn to work together. I don't think I gave you all these uh, verses, guys, in the back, so I apologize. If, if you can look them up, that's fine. If not, I'll just summarize. I need you to work with me. You ever heard somebody say that? Maybe it was your boss. <laughs> and they say, just work with me on this, okay? we got to get this thing accomplished. Just work with me. And we have to work with each other, right? We have to work together with each other. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says, Two are better than one. For your work is not in vain. Do you believe and do you agree with me that we have a work as the church, as the body of Christ? We have a purpose, as Pastor Doyce was saying, that's a collective body. And that work is not in vain. Let's work together. Let's work together. Two are better than one. In Ephesians 4, we'd, we'd read it before, but I didn't go down as far as verse 6. Verse 6 says, um, Is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We're all held together. We're held together in that one body by our working together. Secondly, we need each other to watch out for each other. To watch out for each other. You know what a kill D is? Um, it's a little bird. Some people call it a killdeer, but killdee. Uh, they, uh, you'll see them on the ground. They don't make their nest up in trees, but they'll make a nest. And they're, um, if Mike was in here, he'd probably say they're annoying. <laughs> so is it okay to say those are, they're annoying? Uh, they build, they put their eggs in the most, in the worst place they could in your yard, and uh, they're always in the way. And you know they're there, don't you? Has anybody had killdees put uh, eggs in their yard? Okay, you know they're there. How? The mama makes some noise, don't she? And it would be true with lots of different animals like that. But if you get close or you start heading in the direction of where her eggs are, she's going to And she's going to go off, and she's uh, going real fast across the yard like this, and she's trying to get you away from her eggs. To protect them. And I saw another thing on um, Discovery or something about uh, other birds that do similar type things. But she pretends like she's hurt. And she'll put that feather out to the side and it looks like she's injured. And that's so that the predator thinks they've got an easy target over there in the mama bird. And they'll leave the eggs alone and they'll go after the mama bird. And she'll, she'll kind of limp along and she's got her, her wing kind of hanging over to the side. And then you get close and she just flies off. And then she'll go back to her egg and she'll protect her egg some more. But she's watching out for her babies. Huh? She's watching out for her babies. I think we need some mother hens in the church as part of the church body. That could be your function to watch out for the babies. And I believe we have some. We have some. And you don't actually have to be a mother to do this. But we need to watch out for each other, especially those new ones in the body, those Remember how I said they come to the fellowship in the first place? We didn't vote them in or they didn't join or sign something. They were born again into the body of Christ, into the fellowship. And we need some mamas that's going to watch out for them, that's going to help them to develop. It's going to make sure that they make it out of that uh, stage of their life and they mature and they grow. We need each other to watch out for each other. Philippians 2, 4 says... To look out for others' interests before our own. Well, that makes it a little different, though, doesn't it? Okay, I'm all right with you know helping out, watching out for people, as long as I can take care of myself, too. But this says to watch out for other people's interests before your own, even. Let God work with you on that, challenge you on that. Ecclesiastes 4.12 gives us a picture of two soldiers fighting back to back. Covering each other's backsides, I guess you could say. Now, you've heard the expression, I got your back. Mr. Pierce, if I, if I say, uh, I got your back, you know what I mean, right? It means I'm watching out for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to protect you if something comes up against you. And this in Ecclesiastes is a picture of soldiers fighting. And I don't know if you know it, but as the body of Christ, you're not only just in a family, 
you're in a battalion. We're fighting. We're soldiers together. And we need to have each other's back. And we're fighting against the schemes of the devil, against things that uh, the principalities, the dark forces. We need to have each other's back. And we need to fight in such a way that we help each other. We need each other in the body of Christ. We are better together. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two may defend themselves. We need each other to protect ourselves. Third, I need others to wait and to weep for me. If one part of the body suffers, 1 Corinthians 12 says, we all suffer. If one part rejoices, we all rejoice. Isn't it good to know you have somebody that can weep with you when you're going through a hard time? And also encourage you, but sometimes you just need to cry. Sometimes you just need to weep. Sometimes you need just a shoulder to cry on. And also to rejoice with you when you've had victories in your life. That it's not just something that you're solo on and you have to pat yourself on the back and say, well, I got through that one. But we can rejoice with each other and we can help each other along the way and encourage each other. Can you say we need each other? Now let's say it together. We need each other. We're better together. I want to read um, one more time Jesus' prayer for us in John chapter 17. I don't feel like uh, God is really directing me any further with anything else but just to tell you that we're better together. We're better together. And let's um, do our part to help Jesus' prayer come true for us as a body here. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me. Can we say, I believe in him? I believe in him. Okay, so this is us that all of them may be one. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It's not just uh, for us so that we feel good about working together. You know, as a coach... There's nothing more rewarding than seeing the team work together for the common goal. And that's a rewarding thing to see that. But it's not about just us feeling good and seeing how working together is great. But it's for the world that doesn't know him yet. For the world that doesn't know him yet, when we are together, when we're united together as God intends for us to be, as Jesus prayed for us to be, then the world may believe in Jesus. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. There's a world that needs to know that they're loved. There's a world that needs to know that there's a God who loved them so much that he wasn't satisfied with them just perishing as they were, but made a way that they could be brought into relationship with God again as it was from the very beginning. Even in the garden, God said it is not good that man should be alone. He knows that we're, we're not meant to be isolated or separated from each other. We're meant to be together with him. And God made a way for that. He loves us so much. And the world needs to know that. And they can know that through our unity, our working together. 
we're better together. You know, uh, back a little bit earlier, a few verses, or a few chapters early in chapter 14, Jesus says something that's pretty astonishing, speaking to his disciples again. And I told you I was going to end on chapter 17, but I got this. Jesus told them, Believe me, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So there's more togetherness with Jesus and the Father. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Did you catch what he said? He was talking about the miracles that he had done. He said, they will do, speaking of those who believe in him and have faith in him, in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these. Better together. We're better together. Now, there's probably a lot of debate on what exactly Jesus meant by that. But I, I don't think I would be wrong by saying that simply that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come, and it's accomplished when we are together, when we are unified, when He is in us, the Father in Him, and we're all together like that. The best is yet to come. Greater things are still to come. Let's stand. I didn't really give you uh, anything to, I don't think I did. God may. God works in all kinds of ways that I don't know about, of course. I gave you some challenges on working together with each other and being patient and uh, enduring, having allowances, making allowances for each other and working together, making efforts to work together. And I hope that you can think about where we are as a church, where you are as an individual who's a part of the church, an important part of the church, I want to remind you. And how are we moving along as the body of Christ as he would want us to do?